<clears throat> All right, so good afternoon and welcome to um, lecture eight, where we'll be talking about um, you know, implementation um, of an application using object oriented method. Uh, hopefully, by the end of this lecture, you'd have seen some of the key considerations that are necessary when you'd have been given a problem to solve and you have decided to solve it using object oriented design. Um, so, we're going to first talk a little bit about uh, the things that are necessary in the design phase, then the implementation or what we call coding. And then once you code, you have to then test. And um, thereafter, um, you can be satisfied that your solution works once it passes the test. All right, so, um, so we'll discuss several approaches that can be taken to constructing a uh, simple or object-oriented program. We want to keep it relatively simple. Um, so that we don't cloud um, the, the main points that we want um, too much. All right, so we'll look at discovering classes using some of the methods we have discussed so far. Um, and we will look at how the program can be structured to properly um, adhere to some of the good design practices or what we call principles, all right? All right, so we start with design. So we have... Um, a program to manage events, right? And our documentation suggests that the system will be implemented in three phases in order to facilitate smooth transition. Phase one, two, and three. Um, and then as you read through my description here, you would have seen uh, we use a very basic principle of first identifying the nouns that are in the description. And these nouns are underlined um, in, this, in this example. So I've gone ahead and identified a noun, but that because that is um, primary school level activity, I'm sure everybody knows how to identify nouns, right? Okay, so in this case, uh, some of the nouns you would note are not going to be so important in the determination of our outcomes, uh, which, which is what our program should do. And so when you, when you think, when you look carefully, you realize that some of these need to go. Right? So for example, in our case, we see system phase transition, phase one council, and others as being things that are not going to be necessarily important for um, our, our program in terms of its functions and the data that needs to be stored and manipulated in our classes. All right, so we strike out the unimportant nouns. Um, and of course, don't ever think that you will get it right from here because as you go along, you might discover that some of the things that were not explicitly stated will still um, need um, some representation in your system as you go along. So this is never a complete process because you'll have to periodically revisit. The point is made often that you cannot expect that the first time you do it, whatever you write down, it is going to be the full um, set of things that you will all need right to implementation and testing. All right, so here we have a list of all the nouns. The next step is really to determine which of these really should be um, classes and which of them should be attributes in and of themselves, okay? Now, this is where some creativity and, you know, individual decision-making has to take, take over, right? Because what you will find is that, for example, um, name can be represented in multiple ways, yes? I could have... Um, a name object, well, I could create a class for name, right? And that would store um, first name, last name, right? And probably middle initial, right? Yes? Now, another person will say we'll just use a string object or a string buffer. All right, to represent um, name. Okay, one question? Okay. Um, and so on and so forth. Now, if we recognize that our design is going to be um, a particular way at this stage, then we start thinking immediately, right? If we're gonna use this as a, an attribute or as a class, Okay, then the next thing to start thinking about if we identify it as a class is okay, what are going to be the pieces in that class? Yes, now 
My initial identification was two classes, right? One here um, called event, right? And we have a user interface. That's a starting point. Now the event type, it's either a class or an attribute, okay? Have decided yet. So we have event, and we know that event has a reference number, a name, a description, type, location. Notice we haven't specified any data type as yet. Right? Notice here, we haven't specified any data type as yet. We have identified the visibility, however. Notice our plus here for status and our minus for everything else, okay? We haven't started determining the relationship between classes as yet. We're not at that stage, okay? So that is our next step. Now, as we go along, we need to make decisions um, regarding our attribute types, right? Remember, attributes store data in some form determined by the programmer. So these are separate concerns from how the data is presented to the outside world. Always remember that. The internal structure of your class must be hidden, right? And the presentation to the outside world must be directed through your methods. Yes? So a programmer might decide to store a string as either a string buffer or a string object. That doesn't have to be necessarily visible because that's an internal representation inside the class, okay? If access to is to be granted to that or manipulation, it must be allowed, a method should be doing that, okay? What, what that essentially will mean is that if somebody is using the class and using the method and you change the internal structure, right? Then the, the, the update that is made to the internal structure doesn't impact the use by another part of the application because it's talking through something that is already provided. Okay? So once the way the attribute is reported to the outside world is consistent with the requirements, everything is okay. Yes? Now some attributes may use standard predefined classes, others we will have to define them ourselves. Yes? So for example, here's one decision that we, we, we made here. We made a decision that reference number is an integer, right? But event type is going to be another class, right? And over here, we define an event type in terms of a code that it carries, a description of the type, and the fee associated with that event, okay? And we say the relationship between event and event type is that an event has an right. event type, okay? Yes. Now, notice we also decided here to have an enumerated class called status, which is going to be used over here to tell whether or not the event has been applied, approved, or rejected. Now, what do you remember about enumerated classes? Remember, this is a type-safe class, right? Which means that the values that can be assigned to any object of this class are fixed, okay? Which means that any event that has a status, the value associated with that event must be either applied, approved, or rejected. You cannot put an arbitrary value in status, all right? Now, uh, a point to no yes? So in the program, if you want to enter, so for example, status, do you want to pump the user for the status? How do you do that in Java? How do you do that in Java? So as you prompt the user to put in the status. Right, what you have to do, you can design your interface. Um, you say your interface concerns are, are usually a little different, but let me just come in. You can design your interface to allow the user to see the options for applied, approved, and rejected, and they can select one of those, and you make sure that the value the ordinal value associated with those are what are passed in. Okay, yeah, I get it. That was right. well planned, but I was just making sure, just in case it was the other way. Because right. as you know, in, in um, command, in um, a console, as opposed to an actual Java interface, per se. 
Right. So the interface is, is one, is something separate. Now, the thing is, if you write your program and um, you made the mistake of assigning a value that is outside of the list of values in the enumerated type to status, for example, the compiler is going to complain. So the compiler is going to throw an error, right? An exception, sorry. Yes? So you will get an error there. So it, it protects you from having the wrong value um, in, 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 in that um, variable. Yes? All right. So we have taken the decision to represent date and time as strings. Note here, date and time, start date, start time, and start date are strings, right? End time is a string. Some people might think that's a bad decision, right? Why? Because Java actually have some built-in classes that um, handle proper um, date and time, and the, the value of using those is that you can do things like adding and subtracting um, date and time values to be able to determine like number of days or number of hours that have passed and so on, which obviously you can't do with a string. Right? Now, we have to make those decisions on the basis of what our application needs are. You with me? Yeah. So you don't just willy-nilly say, okay, I have to use this or I have to use that. Those are application-specific things. So what if we never have the need to do those kinds of date and time manipulation, but date and time is just something that you store as a reference information to know when something was applied for or when it was approved or something. And you never need to be able to calculate any difference in data or time and those kinds of things. Then it's okay because your application needs don't go beyond, okay? But it's a decision that you have to make and neither way is necessarily wrong once your justification um, for that design is sufficient. And the second point of that, once the purposes for your application are well served, all right? So our decision was just to use a string, okay? It probably makes it easier, probably makes it harder. Whichever way, it's a design decision that you have to make. Okay, so, so far we have event and event type, okay? Notice something here. Even though we have a connection between event and event type here, we have none to enumerated type status, okay? Um, it is part of how UML actually suggests that we do things. Enumerated types are not necessarily usually connected, right, to anything. Um, they are said to just um, exist in the application domain and can be used, okay? Um, because in a sense, maybe you can look at it as, um, for example, if you look at an integer, right, um, well, probably that's not a good example. Let's just say that enumerated types from an UML perspective um, is not usually um, drawn in the association relationships. Um, it is usually represented on the class diagram, but without connections, okay? Um, much of this might be discussed further in, in object-oriented design when you go a little deeper into um, designing um, full application using um, UML. All right, now model classes represents the data that the system stores, okay? Controller classes are also needed to manage the data. You will also need a class that allows the user to interface with the program. These are not always easily identified, right, when you are doing um, known extraction, but the CRC method is particularly interested in that. Okay, so which class is going to be representing the data? Which class is going to kind of help to control the movement of data between points? That's our controller, right? And then how are we going to allow the user to access them? That's our user interface, our interface um, classes, right? Now, you can imagine that based on our description of how the CRC um, plane is done, 
where we say, okay, I would like to do this. And somebody with that card hold up and say, yes, I can help you do that and so on and so forth. If you go through that process, then you will be easy. It will be easier for you to identify which class is going to be doing what and which class can be invoked by which one and so on and so forth. Yes. And that usually helps us to determine how the system is going to accomplish its objectives. And so we realize that a shortfall of the known extraction exercise, right, is that it doesn't always allow us to identify all of the classes that we might need in order to get the application together and working as is required. All right? Now, for controller classes, the problem we are solving requires that the program allow the user to create an event, edit an event type, create an event, or oh, I have that twice, oh, event type, and then list all events. Those are things that must be orchestrated, right, by some controller class that is causing those model classes to do some sequence of actions to make this work. Yes? So the program is also required to provide a text-based user interface, and we need two additional classes. A class that knows how to manage all events, and a class for the user interface. So here we go. This is the resulting design. And let's break it down. Notice what we did here. We have a text user interface which has two methods, a start and a text user interface um, constructor which takes in an event manager. Everybody sees that? Yes? The event manager consist of a list of events and a list of event types. Everybody with me so far? And what can this do? It can create an event type and an event, right? Those are the two things it can do. Everybody all right so far? Yes. Good. Now, in creating an event, it depends on the event class, right, in order to be able to create my event, right? And that's weak connection, right? Yes? Good. We have another weak connection here because it's the same thing with event type to be able to create a list of event types. Okay? Now, an event that I create has an event type represented here. It also has a status which is accessed through this enumerated type here. So in my text UI, my start, for example, is going to be creating some logic that is going to allow the user to manipulate the event manager, right? Which is going to be passed in to my text UI class. So my user interface takes in an event manager object. An event manager has a list of events, a list of event types, and can create um, new event and so on and so forth. Now, the text UI, you would imagine, doesn't know the structure of the event manager. It only knows that it can, access, it can create an event and an event type. Yes? The internal representation is hidden from text UI. Now, what is the major benefit of doing something like this? Watch this. If I decide I wanted to, to create a GUI over here, yes, I could do the same thing, yes, and all of a sudden, I have two different interfaces for my event management system. You see that? No. If I had taken the other approach where I create a driver class that 
does all of this and it brings together these other classes, then what would happen is that every time I want to change the interface, I would have to now modify that driver class. Everybody see that? Yes or no? Yes. yes. All right, so what we've been doing so far, we've been creating a driver class with a main inside of it, and generally we would create a list, the two lists in there, and then we would have some um, interaction um, code that asks the user to, to pass in some stuff, and then we instantiate all the things and put them in the list and so on and so forth, yes? We usually put that in the main. The problem with that is that if we want to change the text-based menu that we create or in interface that we create, then we'd have to now modify that name. With this kind of approach, where the system basically rests in this event manager here, we can then access it using any interface that knows how to create an event, that can instantiate an event manager, and then we can do all the things that the event manager system provides. So the interface is solely just what is presented on the screen to be able to allow the user to interact, which means that I can get rid of this and create another one, a one called GUI, right? Or a one called ABC, right? And then all of a sudden, I am still able to use it with these. Okay? Now, that makes for separation of concerns. My interface, my system, they are separate. They don't depend, they are not coupled so tightly. Yes? Now, thing to note that this is one suggested way. There are many other suggested ways that a um, problem like this could be solved using OOP. And so importantly, you have to note that there is never one possible design for a program. So for example, in the case of this problem, the list of event types might be kept as a static attribute in the event class instead of being held by the event manager object. All right? So we could change the design, right? So that the list of event type is no longer there, right? But we could maintain it inside event, okay? And that list of event type would be static. And we know that when we use a static modifier, all of a sudden, it's no longer A. It's no longer A. Instance variable, very well. So that one variable is shared by all instances. It becomes a class variable, okay? So that's another way of designing it. Doesn't make it wrong. Okay. Also, the user interface could be implemented as separate classes, perhaps one for managing event types and another for managing events. Yes? So I could, for example, here, instead of just having text UA here, I could have event T U um, user interface. I don't write so well, sorry. And um, I could have event. UI, okay? And then those probably will have um, separate um, logic that is going to invoke the different things. So that would invoke primarily the event type and this would primarily be related to the event. And this is a way of, for example, when you have restricted um, options for different users, Right, you can always have multiple different interfaces um, to the same application, but they are restricted in different ways. Right, so the structure is hidden, but then a particular interface is built for a particular type of user or um, level of use. Yes, <clears throat> all right. So I made a note about separation of concern. It might seem that event manager class should control the user interface, which is what I was suggesting, right? So sometimes 
our event manager class would really be our user interface manager or a driver class, but we're separating concerns. So you could design this class so that it contains code to display the menu and prompts the user for commands and inputs. But this would not be a good choice because I gave you the suggestion already. What happens if you want to change user interface to, for example, a GUI or an applet or a web, you know, displayed through a web page, right? You would have to remove the code for the text user interface and replace that code with appropriate commands for the GUI or the applet, right? So the better design is one which separates the user interface from the rest of the application as we have shown over here. Yes? So in, in reality, this is our application. And then we can tack on any user interface we want. Yes? And that's how we have separated. One is about how do we get the user to manipulate and one is about how the program works. <laughs> right? So we have separated the two things, which means that at any point in time, we can change that interface. Right? Without affecting the structure of the application itself. Yes? All right. So the approach would, the other thing is that, um, oh, I, I made a point about this already, that um, we pass in um, an event manager here. So we create an instance of the application and pass the instance of the application to the interface. And therefore you realize that any interface we create, all we need to do is to pass an instance of the application um, to that interface and we're in business. Okay, and in that case, we have a user's relationship, right? Um, um, sorry, in that case, we would have a composition relationship instead of uses. All right, so the other concern with the responsibilities of the main method is with the responsibilities of the main method. In most cases, main method is not supposed to contain a lot of logic. And unfortunately, um, a lot of your designs tend to um, have this error. So ideally, the application logic should be in a controller class with limited amount of functionality in the user interface class and even less in the main method. Right? As a matter of fact, ideally, your main method should look like this. So now your main method, all your main method does is to invoke an instance of the user interface which takes in an instance of your event manager and you set the program to start. That's it. Now, you will see when we do graphical user interface that this is actually how um, a lot of things are going to get done. Our, our uh, main method is going to look relatively short. Right? Because we, we try hard to enforce the separation of concerns because building an interface is an involved process, right? Sorry, building a graphical user interface is an involved process, which is separate from the application logic. All, your interface is just there to link the user to certain things that exist, okay? All right. So finishing up the design, a fair amount of work remains to be done with the design, mainly the methods that are needed in each class, which we haven't talked about as yet because we've been focused on just identifying the class and their attributes. Um, once all that has been done, it's time to start coding. Uh, remember to design, the design might have to be revisited as soon as you start coding. Never think that your design is complete. Right? We would like to think that the sequence of activities to develop our application is we start with the problem, we come up with a design, we implement, we test, and we don't know. It's an iterative process. So sometimes you're in the middle of testing and that's when you realize that you have a flaw in your design. And you have to go back, fix it, and then move on. All right? So just understand that it's a normal condition for you to go back to a previous stage right? um, as you advance. Um, all right? So 
Those were just some consideration for design. Any questions, any comments? Everybody happy, good. All right, so once you're ready to code, remember our design is like our blueprint. It is what now is going to um, drive us to implement that solution, okay? Because we came up with the solution in the design, now we're gonna implement it. Now many decisions have to be made when coding begins. One of the main decision um, concerns where to start with the coding, okay? And depending on your personal preference, you know, um, you can pick one of three approaches, all right? The first approach is to um, code the lower level classes first. Another approach is to code the user interface classes first. And some people like to code everything then put it all together. Now, approach numero one is hardly ever successful except for very tiny projects, right? You cannot just try to do everything all at once and then when you think everything is done, you try to put it together. That creates serious nightmares. Yes? The only time I see that tend to work is, um, you know, there are some companies that do prefabricated concrete where they, 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 they fabricate all of the concrete somewhere else and then carry it on a truck and fit it together and it just come together, right? <laughs> but the only problem is that um, programming is a little bit more intangible than that. <laughs> you don't have precise measurements and, and things um, in programming um, such that things are going to come together and fit seamlessly. So you're setting yourself up for a lot of work around. Now, because of the pitfalls of something like that, for anything, you know, more than, I would say, 2,000 lines of code, anything reaching in the thousands of lines of code, where it starts getting to become a, you know, a, a sizable small project, not, no longer a tiny small project, um, you might want to do either the top down or the bottom up approach. Okay, so let's talk about those two approaches. The top down approach, the user interface classes are written first. So you go from the perspective of defining how your interface is going to look, what is to be included in it and all of that. And then the lower level classes are partially coded using stub methods. And what a stub method is really um, an outline of the method header, right, with no code in it. It's like what you would write in your interface, except for some methods, for example, if you think about it, if a method has a return type, right, then you have to put a return something in there or else you'll get an error. Okay? So for example, if a method is set to return a string, you have to like return a string that says under construction. But for all other methods that have return type of void, then you just um, write the parameters um, if it takes in any, and sometimes you just don't matter putting the parameters for the time being, just write the, 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 the signature and your curly brackets open and close and you leave it as that, okay? Now, as your coding progresses, Right, the lower level classes are coded and integrated with the rest of the program. So essentially what you do, you would build a menu. Let's say you build um, your interface as a menu. Item one does X. Item two does Y. Item three does Z. So that's your menu, yes? Um, then you say, okay, this is all of my user interface. So what do I need to do now? is to build my skeleton class, my stub classes, yes? That will support all of this, and then I start now filling in my stub so that I can get that working. Then I fill in all the stubs so I can get this working. Then I fill in my other stub to get that working, and then I'm done. With me? So the top-down approach, the following um, approach might be taken, the text UI, um, for our problem, we code that class and then we write the stub methods for event manager, 
event event type and then status is so simple that we can just write it remember it's an enumerated type you know it, <laughs> a few lines all right now we start filling out code for the event manager class um, by starting with the constructor right and so on and then we we keep adding as we go along um, to get things together okay now here's an example of what our stub methods might look like um, for our event manager class notice I just have the visibility modifier the return type name no parameters yet start and finish okay so basically all of my classes will look like that to start off once I implement my GUI that's what I will have right and then I start filling in now there are some um, advantages and disadvantages right um, because you might have to ensure that change is needed at the higher level code when lower level um, code are changed higher level code is changed are done okay so you might exclude some things um, at the level of for example event manager because you haven't finished the stubs yet you have to make sure you go back and, and get those done but in general the top-down approach gives a good overview of how the application will look and feel because you're filling out all the stubs all the classes and everything yes to start out in some cases the program can be partly useful before it's completed so if you fully implement one or two of the classes right remember you finish the interface already so your interface can now be used to access those things that are already working and it's an easy way of now testing to see if things are working as you go along rather than waiting until you do everything then you build the interface to be able to test right which is another approach now um, some programmers prefer to write the harder things first while some programmers um, prefer to write the easier things first right whichever you prefer um, because some people are more keen on getting something working to feel a sense of boost right um, and so you can you can focus on the easier things to get them working first get them out of the way and then you leave the complex tasks until later so that's one one other advantage now with bottom-up approach what you do is to code the lower level classes first and then you end up having to do a little bit of work because then you end up having to write some driver classes to test each class by themselves to make sure they are working right and sometimes how you do that is to write a, a method inside right a main method inside right to um to test the class or you write a separate driver class but immediately you realize that oh boy i'm going to be writing a little bit more code here in any case some people view this as a good approach because you can test one class independently by itself to make sure it is working before you integrate it or get it to work with other things and generally if it's working well um, at that stage then all you have to worry about is its integration when you're trying to add it um, to the other um the the, the 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 user interface and the other things that need to integrate to make your application work okay now um so the following approach might be taken you write the code for the event type class and test this class then you write the text ui class that is hard coded to create a simple event type next you write code for the event class and test the code all right now here's an example of the driver class text ui um, where we have a main method right and we create an event type equal test and we pass in some nominal values here and then we just print out some message to say you know this is our test and um, here is an example of where we would put our a main method inside our class to allow us um, to do some testing of the event type class um, just the same as I mentioned a while ago 
Now, so which is better? It's like asking the question of which shovel is the best shovel. There's no best shovel, yes? Um, it depends on what you're trying to do. Chinese I'm sure if you have a small pot on your patio that you need to take a little bit dirt out of, a large shovel used in major farms that are attached to tractors will not be applicable. But some people will add that because of mechanization, the tractor is always a good option. But we see the absurdity in that, right? So it depends on what you think and what you need to do. Some programs prefer bottom-up approach. In the cases where the programmer needs, the program needs access to data, example, um, databases and so on, bottom-up is better since data access functions are critical to the rest of the program. So in this case, what you end up having to do, for example, is write all of the code that is going to be dealing with connecting to the database, getting the data, formatting it, and so on and so forth, because everything else in your application depends on it. Now, in that case, you're kind of forced to do the bottom-up approach, right? Because in a sense, what comes in here again is a separation of concerns. You want to get all your data access things working and separate from your application logic, which is going to use the data. Yes? So it suits. So sometimes, depending on what you're trying to do, one approach might work better. Now, there are some programmers who prefer to continuously refine code, and they usually prefer the top-down approach. Okay? Now, so I've given you an idea of a design. I've given you an idea of how the implementation would look. Now, it is very important to note that if it's not tested, you cannot be assured that it works. Now, sometimes we don't recognize that, yes, we actually engage in, in fairly rigorous testing when we are doing our application because once you write your code and you try to see if it works, that's really testing. You put in some sample data and we do it, right? Now, that is usually unit testing where, you know, you are making sure that the, part, the parts of the program you write are okay, all right? But testing takes on, I mean, a significant form, and you will learn in few further courses that sometimes testing can take up to 40% of the resources required to implement a system. It's that important, yeah. right? For our purposes, we're just gonna look on the basics. So, testing should be an ongoing activity. Again, it depends on the approach that you take, right? But you notice, even though we talked about top-down and bottom-up, in each case, we talk about, we talk about using um, either the interface, or writing a separate Java class to make sure that we can test everything as we go along. It is best to test in small steps because if you write too much, say you sit down for a week writing 2,000 lines of code and you have not checked yet to see if it really works. What ends up happening when you start trying to test that there are 2,000 possible places that an error could be, <laughs> right? But if every five to 10 or every logical block of code you write that does something, you check if it's working, then incrementally you are reducing the likelihood of having a, a major um, set of errors when you're done, okay? So testing should be done in small steps. As a section of code our method is written, run a set of tests to ensure that it works. Choose reasonable data for your test. Right? And above all, do not use meaningless data. Right? Because it's gonna be very hard for you to verify that things work how they should work under actual conditions that are expected when the program is being run. 
Now, tests are routine. So, so tests with knowledge of what is expected to happen. So for example, tests are routine that is to calculate 15% of a value with a value like 100. Because you can easily see if the arithmetic is working. Yes? You can, as we would say, eyeball that. And so we can recognize that, okay, if it's working for this, it might work for the other cases. Now, I'll tell you that that can be um, tricky. But if it's not working for the simple case, then you, you are guaranteed it's not going to work for the complex cases. <laughs> right? So we have to start there. Now, test with more than one set of data. So if you use the same bit all the time, you will catch the same all right, so that's it for testing. How about documentation? This is something that is a tragedy. We have to document our code, and it has to be an ongoing activity. Computer programs are usually written for humans. Yes. Eventually, you'll realize that almost every program that you write, at some point in time, if it's useful, somebody will be looking at it. They either want to figure out what's going on and how they can improve it, or they want to be able to add something to it to make things happen differently or to make more things happen. Okay? So a computer cannot execute the Java statements. A computer cannot execute the Java statements you write. That is why your code is translated to byte code for execution. So the code you write is really for other programmers and you to understand what a program does. Okay? So apart from the regular comments that you write for your code, you can write a Java, Java doc tags. It's a special tag that when you want those documentation, you write a slash and two stars, and you end it with a star and a slash. Okay? Now if you do that, there's a, there's a Java doc that, that exe that comes in your development kit that you can run and it will generate an HTML with those comments. Okay? Now, if you don't use this special form, then you won't get those comments in. All right? There are some special tags too that you can use the at author, at version, at param, and at return, which allows you to describe specific things in your documentation. All right, so here's an example of um, documentation in your code. Notice we have the format that we ask for and then inside of it, we have some notes. So we have at author, at version, but then we also have some free form text, okay? And notice our constructor, we have at param, at param, at param. So we are saying the parameter called code is a unique code for event type. The parameter called description is a short description of that and so on and so forth, yes? Now, when you run Java doc, you will get something looking like that. Notice it, what is, it, it tells you the class name is event type. What's the package? Which is where it's located, right? And it gives you a, a, a summary of the constructor. It gives you the version, the author, the constructor, and the methods that are in um, your class. Now, the good thing about this is that somebody can use this documentation as you have been doing to know what is provided and how to utilize your class. Right? As you would see here, this is how the API documentation looks for all the classes that you reuse when you go to the, um, to, to the website, all right? And here is some more information that will be generated by that. Okay, so this lecture has focused on different techniques that can be used to effectively design, implement, and test a program. We first started with identification of classes. Then we started to look at how those classes would be translated into a program. Then we look on two approaches to doing your implementation. We talk a little bit about testing. And of course, I just mentioned a few things on documentation. That's the end.